Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome again to Lahem Panim. You'll remember from our study of Acts chapter 13 last week that Paul and Barnabas, on what would be for Paul his first missionary journey, they were sharing the good news of the gospel in Pisidian Antioch. And they were met with this incredible, awesome response from the people. The whole town shows up the following Sabbath to hear them speak and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so many of them believe. And the Gentiles especially are encouraged to hear from Paul and Barnabas that the way of salvation has been opened up even to them. However, it says in verses 50 to 52, But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they, meaning Paul and Barnabas, they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So, Paul and Barnabas do what you and I are to do when we encounter persecution. They shake it off and they move on. And the next place they journey to is the city of Iconium, a city that was actually a cultural melting pot of Phrygians, Greeks, Jews, Roman colonists, and it was located about 80 miles southeast of where they had just been there in Pisidian Antioch. And as always, they started first in the synagogue. It says, Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, have you ever wished that you could perform a sign or a miracle? (laughs) I know I have. Um, Now, I've done magic tricks ever since I was a little kid, um, illusions. Uh, And I've gotten to experience the joy of having somebody look at me in wonder and amazement, uh, just seeing a compelling illusion. But at the end of the day, They're just illusions. And certainly nothing as compelling as what we find the apostles doing here in the book of Acts. None of their signs or their wonders could ever be mistaken for illusions. And there was irrefutable proof that those whom they healed truly had been lame. They had been blind or even dead. You know, it would be amazing to be able to perform miracles like they did. And what you and I often think is that if we could just perform signs and miracles like they did, then we would be able to convince everybody once and for all that Jesus Christ is God. But what we discover in this passage and in and throughout the Gospels as well is that even if we could perform miracles, that's not going to convince everyone. Jesus had said in his parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 that if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, I'm sure that the disciples reacted the same way to that statement that you and I do. Surely Jesus is overstating things. I mean, that can't be true. But here we see play out that same kind of unbelief that Jesus was talking about. God had given Paul and Barnabas this amazing ability to perform signs and wonders in abundance. But still, not everyone was convinced. And we see that the people are actually divided. It says in verse 4, But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Now, what that says to you and to me is that in our own Christian walks, we need to not waste any time thinking that if we could perform miracles or signs, people would believe. 
or even if we're just dynamic and powerful orators. No, it's the Holy Spirit who convinces people. And you and I, all we are called to do is to simply sow the seeds of the gospel wherever he leads us to. If we do that, then God will be faithful to yield a crop. Now, it says, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them, meaning Paul and Barnabas, and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now, while in Lystra, which is the second of these three cities, Paul has the door opened to perform another miraculous sign. It says, Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now, Paul and Barnabas don't immediately recognize what the people are saying, because neither of them speak Lyconian. The people probably sounded like they were merely expressing wonder or amazement. But no, they were in fact deifying Paul and Barnabas. And they actually thought that Paul and Barnabas were two gods in particular. It says in verse 12, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now, this reaction may seem kind of strange to us, but why the people responded the way that they did was directly tied to a very important piece of local folklore that they had embraced as true. Because according to tradition, two popular gods in the Roman world, Zeus and Hermes, who are also known as Jupiter and Mercury, after whom two of the planets are named, they had once come down in disguise to visit the city of Lystra. And according to legend, they had sought food and lodging from the people there. However, nobody in the city of Lystra showed them what would have been the common courtesy of hospitality that people generally practiced during that time. Nobody except an old couple, a peasant couple by the name of Philemon and his wife Bacchus. And so Zeus and Hermes, they took vengeance on the people of Lystra by killing all of its inhabitants in a localized flood. But Philemon and Bacchus, they rewarded by turning their lowly cottage into a temple of which both of them would serve as priest and priestess. Now, that's important to understand because when the people of Lystra see these miraculous signs that Paul and Barnabas are performing, they immediately put that within the context of their own religion. And they assume that Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes, once again visiting their city. And so they're very determined that this time, they as a people are not going to fail to give Zeus and Hermes the love and worship that they think they deserve. And so they immediately shower Paul and Barnabas with worship and with gifts. And you know, I think that's a reminder to us that when we go to witness in places that we're unfamiliar with, we need to be sensitive to the context because people are not always going to receive our message the way we want them to. They have their own framework of understanding that we need to take the time to know and to understand if we expect them to ever truly hear the message of the gospel as they are meant to. Now, it says in verse 13, And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, he brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. And that was because, as priest of Zeus, it was his responsibility to lead the people into worship. 
Now, eventually, wind of what's going on finally reaches Paul and Barnabas, and they finally understand what's happening. And it says, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments, which was a Jewish expression of horror, of revulsion at blasphemy, and they rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn away from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, I love how open and honest Paul and Barnabas are about the nature of what the people of Lystra believe. They blatantly call the things that they worship vain. But the word can also be translated useless or worthless. Now, that's not something that we in our all-inclusive society would often be willing to say to somebody. It doesn't jive with the multiculturalism that our culture typically subscribes to. But Paul and Barnabas openly declare that their worship of other gods rather than Yahweh, the God of Israel, is worthless. Because these gods, they don't have any power to save. Indeed, they don't even exist. Hence their contrast with the God of Israel, whom Paul and Barnabas call the living God. Now, in the ancient religions of the world, people believed in a syncretism between the realm of the gods and nature. You have to understand that. The gods were as much a part of creation as we are and are therefore enslaved to the same appetites, the same needs. They're dependent on the natural world. And therefore, they don't have any power to save because ultimately, they're slaves, just like you and I are. Now, you and I, we take for granted that God, Yahweh, is the creator of heaven and earth because that's what many of us have been raised to believe. But back then, no one except the Jews talked like that. But that is the reality that Paul and Barnabas try to steer the people to. Yahweh is the maker of heaven and earth, and therefore he is the Lord of heaven and earth. In a way that Zeus, Hermes, or any other false god could never be. He's not bound to our world. That's what is behind this fancy theological word, transcendent that we use in describing God. God's not one with creation. No, he's distinct. And he interacts with his creation, not because he needs us, but because he loves us. What a fundamentally different way of looking at things. I think, what a powerful message to bring to the people of Lystra. But you know, that's a message that you and I also need to bring to the people of our generation. There is a God who is Lord of all things, who made us, who loves us, So much so that he sent his son into our world to bridge the gap between him and us that was created by our sin. So that in and through coming into a relationship with his son, we might have our sins forgiven. And like runaway children who have at last come home, we can be brought back into the family of God. And so I want to encourage you today, embrace the living God. Pray to him. Tell him you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That you want to be in relationship with him. If you do that, you will escape the tyranny of a life lived in vain. For vain things. And you'll find that you have placed at your very center what in fact adds meaning to everything you do and all that you are. Do so today. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. 
We look forward to hearing from you. And thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God. 